Tonight, we are so grateful to have Lori Russell here. She's a former tour guide at the Robert McCormick House at Cantini here in Wheaton. This presentation was scheduled for this past March uh, for Women's History Month, but of course, it had to be rescheduled, so we are so happy to have this presentation here on Zoom. So Lori currently specializes in programs about influential women, past and present, from the Chicago area, and she's a former docent for the Chicago Architecture Foundation, and she's the co-author of the Women of Influence Tour at Graceland Cemetery. So I'm going to hand it over to our speaker, Lori Russell. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Courtney, and thank you to all of you. My hope is that you will find the pictures I'm about to show you fascinating. You will find the stories behind the women just as fascinating and um, understand that even though those of us in Wheaton are familiar with Cantini in our own backyard, the influence of that family has spread nationwide. And I think when I'm finished, you'll understand that completely. And as I said, or as Courtney said, please do type in your questions if you have them. We'll answer them at the end of the program. And some of you may have looked on your email for the family tree. I don't expect all of you to print out that family tree and follow along with me, but later on, if you're confused about all the women who have the same names, there are lots of Catherines, there are lots of Eleanors, there's lots of deviations of the name Alice, not to mention lots of Roberts, you will get some clarification on the family tree. And with that, we will get started. Nobody personifies the quote on the screen more than Robert R. McCormick and his grandfather, Joseph Medill. Together, they built one of the largest publishing empires in the country, but individually, they forever shaped politics, media, and most importantly, the city of Chicago. But my premise is that this family was short on male heirs. While these moguls were working, it was their wives, their daughters, and other female relatives who were creating their own identities and accomplishments. This was at a time when women routinely did not go to college, certainly when they could not vote, and rarely worked in a male professional world. But what Cantini women did have was a fortune, which provided them a certain amount of freedom as they made advances in the arts, philanthropy, politics, and of course, newspapers. Their marriages were really mergers of powerful families, which extended and enhanced the women's influence. We start with Joseph Medill, who came to Chicago in the 1850s. He became owner and editor of the Chicago Tribune, helped found the Republican Party and get Abraham Lincoln elected president and was the mayor of Chicago after the Great Fire. His wife was known as Kitty, and she was his partner both in business and in life. She was college educated and worked side by side with her husband in the newspaper business. And like many society women of the day, Kitty was a club woman and volunteer. She was a founding member of the prestigious Fortnightly Club which is still active today. And she volunteered for the Hospital for Women and Children. During the Civil War, she worked for the Sanitary Commission. This was a precursor to the Red Cross here in Chicago, providing goods and supplies for the Union Army. When Kitty and her friends discovered that women and children were being left out of the Great Fire Relief, they started their own organization to put money directly into the hands of those who needed it most. And nine times out of 10, it was the women and children who needed this extra hand up. The Medills really were a family of great style and influence in Chicago. Their 36 room mansion stood at the corner of Wabash in Ontario and cost over $100,000 to build. Unfortunately, this gorgeous mansion is no longer standing. The family soon came to include three daughters, Catherine, who they called Kate, Eleanor, who was called Nellie, 
and Josephine, who was called Josie. Kate and Nellie were combative, arrogant, intensely jealous of each other, and neither one of them had Josie's sweet spirit. And certainly they had none of their mother's philanthropic spirit either. Uh, unfortunately for the entire family, Josephine died at the age of 25, and this sent all of them into great despair. Even, even the two sisters who couldn't get along agreed that they loved and missed Josie dearly. Both sisters attended St. Mary's Academy in Notre Dame, or in South Bend, near Notre Dame, and they were active in college affairs, but frankly, marriage was the end game. Like all society women of the day, they knew any advancement, any achievement they might accomplish would have to come through the marriage to an important man. Kate was beautiful. She had a fiery temper. She had gorgeous red hair. And she honestly thought that if she married Robert S. McCormick, the nephew of Reaper King Cyrus McCormick, she would have all the luxuries of life and high society. The two were married in 1876. She was 22, he was 27, but it was unlikely match from the very beginning. Robert had perhaps a little bit too independently rejected the reaper business. He thought he would go into law. He thought he would go into commodities. Frankly, he was a failure at both. And he was required to take pretty substantial loans from his father-in-law, Joseph Medill. Eventually though, Robert Sanderson McCormick really did prove himself to be a valuable US ambassador in London, Paris, Vienna, and St. Petersburg, Russia. And this finally gave Kate the lifestyle she was looking for. Robert and Kate McCormick had three children. Their second child, Katrina, died in infancy. Kate could gain the edge by giving her father his first grandson, and she named him Joseph Medill McCormick, and everybody called him Medill. Their second son was called Robert Rutherford in an attempt to make it look like there was Scottish royal blood in the McCormick clan. The two boys rarely lived with their parents. They were shuttled off to English boarding schools before going to Groton and Yale on the East Coast. Eleanor, as you know, was called Nellie, and she spent an inordinate amount of time on her appearance and appearances. In 1878, she married Robert Patterson, whose family had founded the very prestigious Second Presbyterian Church in Chicago and also helped found Lake Forest. But soon after their small wedding, Nellie was calling her husband a hopeless drag on her in society. But Robert Patterson proved himself to his father-in-law. First, he was the night editor for the Tribune, moving on up to become editor in chief. His work ethic, which was widely praised, contrasted mightily with Nellie's intense desire to obtain wealth and social status. Nellie had two children as well. She couldn't resist naming her first son, Joseph Medill Patterson, but had to call him Joe. Her daughter was named Eleanor, but everybody called her Sissy. In an act of defiance towards her mother, Eleanor, Sissy changed the spelling of her first name. Grandfather Medill really disapproved of spoiled boys. He was pretty, pretty tough on these guys but he adored his granddaughter. At the age of 18, Sissy inherited 10 shares of Tribune stock outright, in addition to the dividends she would share with her brother and cousins. Kate and Nellie could not tame their need for luxury and social advancement. It took precedent over their marriages, motherhood, and any kind of volunteer work. Both had mansions in Chicago and Washington, D.C., but never seemed satisfied living in any of them. The sisters would end up receiving cash bequests and income from their Tribune stock after their father died, but they were forbidden to sell that stock to anybody except family, 
and they could not dictate Tribune policy, much to their consternation. And of course, you know, the house on the lower left is what we call Cantini today. The other three houses, thankfully, are all still standing. Kate died of a heart attack in Versailles, France in 1932. Nellie, who by this time had moved to the Drake Hotel, died just one year later. Both are buried next to husbands they did not love and near each other in the Medill family plot at Graceland Cemetery in Chicago. Medill McCormick, as I said, was Kate's oldest son. His true love in life, starting when they were just kids, was Ruth Hannah. Medill and Ruth were married on June 6, 1903 in Ohio, but Mother Kate was conspicuously missing from this ceremony. She absolutely did not approve of the match. But Ruth's maid of honor was Alice Roosevelt, and President Teddy Roosevelt attended the wedding, giving the couple a solid gold coffee service. And with President Roosevelt's blessing, this couple was off and running in the world of progressive politics. Medill was heir apparent to the Chicago Tribune, but gave it up completely in favor of being a politician, first in downstate Illinois, and then moving on into Washington, DC. Ruth was a natural at politics as well. Her first big achievement was to, excuse me, to secure partial suffrage for Illinois women in 1913. She was her husband's trusted advisor on progressive issues like child labor, the eight hour workday, and of course the woman's right to vote. Together, Medill and Ruth were a very effective, very glamorous political team, the Bill and Hillary or Michelle and Barack of their day. But despite political success, despite having three beautiful children and a happy wife, Medill McCormick waged a long and private war with depression. When he failed to win re-election to the Senate in 1925, he committed suicide in Washington. Well, as you can imagine, Ruth is devastated by this and she gives up on Washington and moves to Rockford, Illinois. She purchased two newspapers, a radio station, managed her very own 2,200 acre dairy farm and proved herself to be an, a very adept businesswoman. But politics were in her blood. And by 1928, Ruth was campaigning again with the slogan, no promises, no bunk. And we could use that today, couldn't we? No promises, no bunk. She was elected to Congress and returned to Washington. This feat landed Ruth on the cover of Time Magazine one of the very few female politicians to receive this attention until the 1960s. Ruth eventually remarried to a man named Albert Sims in 1932, and the couple moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico. She founded a school, worked in the arts, developed another cattle ranch. But tragedy struck again when her son, Johnny, Johnny McCormick, died in 1938 while taking pictures in the Rocky Mountains. He was struck by lightning. Johnny was the only male grandchild of Kate and Robert S. McCormick, and the only male who could have advanced that family name. She endowed the Colorado Fountain Valley School for Boys in his memory. Ruth Hannah McCormick spent the remainder of her life following her passions, including the Republican Party. She died in 1944 and is buried in Albuquerque. Katrina was the oldest child of Ruth and Medill McCormick, and she married Cortland Barnes in 1935. Look at this wedding train. This is the picture that appeared in the Chicago Tribune, and isn't it gorgeous? Katrina, though, was as liberal as the rest of her family was conservative, and she especially did not care for her uncle Robert McCormick's brand of conservative politics. In 1945, Trini sold all of her Tribune stock back to McCormick 
for $3 million and promptly turned it around and gave all of it away completely anonymously. She also published a magazine, a very liberal leftist magazine called Common Sense and endowed a scholarship in her name at the University of Denver. And the scholarship was exclusively for minority students. Of Ruth McCormick's two surviving children, it was Basie who went on to follow the Medill newspaper legacy. Basie married Peter Miller in 1941, and the two of them ran their mother's newspapers and other business concerns here in Illinois. To me, Basie was an early example of a post-World War II mother with a career, but I'm sure she had no idea where this career was going to take her because when her uncle Robert McCormick purchased the Washington Times, he installed Basie at its, as its editor-in-chief. So the young Miller family moves to Washington where Basie finds herself butting heads with politicians, with editors, and her own uncle who is micromanaging the newspaper from Chicago. As close as they were, she and Robert began to differ politically and personally, causing a pretty big rift in their relationship. And regardless of his own personal life, which we're going to talk about in a moment, Anne Basie's pretty superior work ethic, she was pretty widely respected at the newspaper, Robert McCormick fired Basie when she divorced her husband and married Garvin Tankersley. He dismissed her completely on the basis that she was getting a divorce. He also put the paper up for sale. And Basie and Garvin tried very hard to buy it, but couldn't raise enough money for it. And the Times Herald was sold to the Washington Post. Well, much like Ruth, Basie and Garvin are fed up with Washington. They move to Arizona and become the premier breeders and trainers of Arabian horses, not only here in the United States, but around the world. <coughs> Excuse me. Basie devoted herself to her Arizona ranch, philanthropy, and something she called the Black Stallion Reading Program, which was a, a charitable-based organization for disadvantaged children to help them learn to read and to receive books at home. Basie died at the age of 91 in 2013. Meanwhile, as they say, Robert McCormick is back in Chicago running the Chicago Tribune. He didn't even think about falling in love and think of marriage until he was in his 30s when he met Amy Irwin Adams. Amy came from an elite military family. She was born at Fort Riley, Kansas, but educated in France. Her father was a West Point graduate and the first man to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor. The family moved to Chicago in 1893. Amy and Robert became increasingly close, but Amy had one really big problem. She was already married to Edward Adams of Lake Forest. Her affair with Robert rapidly became the talk of the town, and that gossip grew when she filed for divorce. So here is Amy with an impeccable degree, pedigree, excuse me, a member of the Tony on Wencia Club in Lake Forest, an accomplished artist, gardener, clubwoman, horsewoman, but being slandered in the press. On top of that, Amy was definitely not Kate McCormick's choice of a wife for her son, due in part to the fact that Amy was seven years older than Robert. Rather than accepting Amy into the family, Kate contributed to all the gossip, calling Amy that old hag. Kate threatened disinheritance, tried slanderous threats, and finally hit on the idea of a long separation and a bribe to stop this marriage. And if you remember, Kate's husband was the ambassador in St. Petersburg, Russia. She used her Russian connections to give Robert the chance to interview Tsar Nicholas and the Russian army. And this was really quite a coup within journalism standards. She also sweetened the deal by giving Robert $50,000 as a gift. 
So McCormick set sail for England on his way to Russia in February of 1915. Very few people knew that Amy was following him on a different ship and would be staying at a different hotel. The two were married on March 10th, 1915 in London. And as you can imagine, Kate was furious and for her entire life never accepted Amy into the family. And Robert never returned the $50,000. In addition to other wedding gifts he bought his wife, he gave her an exquisite double strand of pearls, which she wore every day of her life. So Amy takes on the life of a military wife, albeit a very privileged one. Her honeymoon really was spent in Russia. Robert did go over there and interview the Tsar. And then she followed Robert to San Antonio when the National Guard was mobilized along the Mexican border. But World War I took both McCormick's to Paris, where Robert joins up with General Pershing and the 1st Division. Amy, being an army brat herself, wants to serve, and she does it the only way a woman could in those days and that was to be a nurse. She drove an ambulance as well as worked in French field hospitals while her husband, her brother, and other friends and relatives were fighting the war. The McCormicks returned to Chicago after the war and they set up household on their uh, Astor Street mansion on, in the Gold Coast, but much to their dismay, that old gossip continued to haunt them. They decided to get out of the city of Chicago, move to the peace and quiet of Kate's Wheaton home, and renamed it Cantini in honor of the battle McCormick had fought in France. Amy absolutely adored the countryside where she could ride, raise her dogs and livestock, and to paint. Robert solved the commute problem by installing an airstrip and flying to work every day. He landed his seaplane on Lake Michigan and a motorboat would pick him up and take him up the Chicago River to Michigan Avenue. Amy never lost her love of painting and studied all of her life. Finally, a studio was built for her on the Cantini grounds called Bois de Mesdames, and it is still standing, although it is in private hands right now. Amy was also an astute art collector with a checkbook. Her taste went from Degas to Picasso, and by 1935, her collection was, called, was being called one of the most interesting in the city. After her death, uh, as an aside, Robert McCormick donated all of her pieces to the Art Institute. And they're called the Amy McCormick Memorial Collection. And several of them are still, at least as of last spring, were still on display. Amy was diagnosed with cancer in 1937, but kept up appearances by writing, painting, entertaining. Amy passed away in 1939. She was buried in her nurse's uniform with full military honors. The service was conducted on the Cantini grounds around a horseshoe shaped altar covered in dahlias, which were her favorite flower and the colonel's airplane sprinkled rose petals over all of the guests and the ceremony. And if you look in the lower uh, photo in the upper left-hand corner, you can see that airplane going by. Ultimately, a beautiful tomb was built on the grounds uh, with statues of Amy's beloved dogs flanking the tomb. Uh, the Colonel's last gesture, and you'll see this if you go visit Cantini, is that he changed Amy's birth date to indicate that the two of them were born on the same day, or not the same day, but the same year. And that, in his mind, erased the stigma of her always being called the older woman. A few years after Amy died, the Colonel began spending more time with Marilyn Matheson Hooper. Marilyn was a wife and the mother of two girls, and she and her husband were really part of the same social stratosphere as the McCormicks. Marilyn and Amy were actually good friends who liked writing together, painting, playing bridge together. And in fact, when Amy 
died, she asked that that beautiful pearl necklace be made into three separate strands with one of the necklaces going to Marilyn. After her divorce, the Colonel and Marilyn married in December of 1944. The groom was 64, the bride was 47. Cousin Joe Patterson was the Colonel's best man. And even Life Magazine covered this event because by this time, Colonel Robert R. McCormick is a very important man and very newsworthy. Well, Marilyn was no different than Amy. She actually loved being Mrs. Robert R. McCormick. Her parties in Chicago and Washington were sought after invitations. The couple's annual Christmas party on Astor Street was considered the social event of the season. She loved to ride and spent many happy hours on horseback with Robert, as well as sharing his love of dogs. Notice, I forgot to mention this with another picture, but notice that uh, Marilyn is riding side saddle. Both Marilyn and Amy rode side saddle and took jumps uh, side saddle. Marilyn loved to travel the world with a colonel on his custom B-17 bomber. And while she was traveling, she would file articles to the Chicago Tribune about their travels and their adventures. And of course, shopping for this woman was very easy. When one of the Colonel's airplanes could fly her directly from Cantini to Meg's Field in 15 minutes. Marilyn loved collecting Asian art and decorating her homes. And like Amy, Marilyn was a passionate dog lover and dedicated a good part of her charitable fortune to the Anti-Cruelty Society in Chicago. Marilyn outlived her husband by 30 years after his death in 1955. His will granted her $100,000 yearly income, yearly income, but absolutely no say in Tribune business. And after his death, Cantini became a museum and Marilyn moved to Washington. But Chicago really was home and she returned here in 1970, excuse me, 71, along with her Asian art, her antiques, four dogs and a bird, and set up household in beautiful apartments on Lakeshore Drive. Marilyn died in 1985 and is buried in the Medill family plot at Graceland. Little Eleanor Patterson, called Sissy, all of her life was the daughter of Eleanor and Robert Patterson and the only granddaughter of patriarch Joseph Medill. Given that she had a brother and two male cousins, it's easy to see why she was a tomboy. But she was also a wild child, giving her mother fits over decorum and men. Eventually, though, Sissy had a proper finishing school education, a lavish debut at her mother's Washington, D.C. home. Her gown was by Worth, her jewels were by Cartier. And best friend Alice Roosevelt, Al, excuse me, Alice Roosevelt, complained, bit, complained bitterly to her father. Her debut wasn't nearly as lavish as Sissy's, and poor President Roosevelt said that he did the very best he could on his presidential salary. In 1902, Sissy was presented to the royal court in Vienna under the watchful eye of her Aunt Kate. There she met Count Joseph Gazicki, who everyone called Gizzy. Sissy was immediately smitten. Despite the Count's advanced age and extremely questionable background, she was determined to marry him. Even her good friends and her cousins could not dissuade her from the marriage that took place on April 14, 1904 in the drawing room of the Washington House. Um, you'll notice in the Washington, in the New York Times headline, it says, father disapproves, but will give her a good dowry. And that makes you wonder what the Count's motives were all along. Well, dreams of living in a castle were quickly dashed when Sissy arrived at the Count's rundown home in Poland. Her charmed life was now one of loneliness, abuse from her husband, in a country she did not understand 
or appreciate. She became pregnant. She had a darling little daughter named Felicia, but this did not help the marriage. Finally, when Felicia was two years old, Sissy took her daughter and they fled to London. She resumed her frenzied social life, leaving her daughter in the care of nannies and governesses. Well, the Count, knowing that Felicia is his trump card, kidnapped this baby and installed her in an Austrian convent for safekeeping. This move brought on the full wrath of the Patterson McCormick clan. They hired detectives. They appealed to President Taft. They even went to Tsar Nicholas, anything they could to get Gizzy to return the baby. Ultimately, the Count renounced all claims to his daughter, accepted divorce, and one half million dollars simply to go away. After being away for eight years, Sissy finally returned to the United States and decided to start over. Well, she needs a break from this dramatic life, and so she goes straight to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, with a Felicia, a maid, and seven trunks. Almost immediately, Sissy fell in love with the beautiful scenery and natural way of living, so she sent the maid and the trunks home back to Chicago, and she and Felicia became cowgirls. She also fell in love with Kel Carrington, who was an authentic cowboy who must have seemed so real and refreshing after the pompous count. They remained close their entire lives, but never married. Sissy eventually bought Cal's Flat Creek Ranch in 1923 and made it her Western home and returned to the ranch every year for the rest of her life. The ranch is still in, hand, in the hands of the family and is now a luxury five-star hotel. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. And if you go there, you can see the romance between Cal and Sissy come to life because they put on a little play called Petticoat Rules every summer about the two. So here's Sissy. She's dividing her time between the ranch, Chicago, Washington, DC, and all the while going back and forth in her private rail car. Her rail car. This was a lavish railroad experience with three births, a full-time steward, an assistant, a chef, a maid, and a secretary, all to get Sissy back and forth across the country. In 1924, she married Elmer Schlesinger, who was a brilliant lawyer in Washington and continued her whirlwind social life. In 1927, she loaned the DC house to her good friend, President Coolidge, and together, Sissy and President Coolidge entertained at a state dinner honoring Charles Lindbergh after his famous flight. But unfortunately for Sissy, all of this came crashing down when Elmer died of a heart attack in 1929. She was left really adrift and wondering just what was next. Newspaper blood ran deep in Joseph Medill's granddaughter, but it was William Randolph Hearst who actually gave Sissy her start in the business. He named her as an editor for his little newspaper called the Washington Herald. Well, Sissy took this job very seriously and increased readership with things like exclusive interviews and very forward thinking ideas that she was learning from her two cousins in the newspaper business. By 1939, Sissy had bought another newspaper, combined the two to create the Washington Times Herald, and at last was doing something that completely intrigued her. She remained editor of the Times Herald for 18 years. But after years of heart problems, heavy smoking, heavy drinking, dramatic living, Sissy died in her sleep in 1948. Everyone from diplomats to night workers at the newspaper attended her funeral in the ballroom of the Washington home. In my opinion, this house had really come full circle. It hosted her debut, her two weddings, 
and finally her funeral. Her casket was covered in yellow roses, which were her favorite, and then carried by that same private rail car to Chicago, where she was buried at Graceland in the Medill plot. Joe Patterson, as you know, was Sissy's big brother and Robert McCormick's cousin. He married Alice Higginbotham in 1902. And let me tell you, this was a who's who's wedding in Chicago with over 600 people coming to the reception. Alice's father was a partner at Marshall Fields and he had been president of the World's Columbian Exhibition. And the marriage was intended to be a merger of two great Chicago families. But Joe wasn't having any of it. Almost immediately, he was bored with marriage, with Alice and conventional society living right from the very beginning, as I said. He goes off and purchases a 300 acre farm called Westwood. And this was up in Liberty, uh, Liberty, Illinois, just north of the city. Alice and their young family moved there under Alice's condition that she could spend as much money as she wanted turning the place into um, a palace. He, on the other hand, was very happy just knowing his children were in the house and he could be with his pigs and his rich farmland. Joe, Far or Joe Patterson may have been a gentleman farmer, but really he's widely created for creating this country's first tabloid newspaper, which was the New York Daily News. From about 1919 on, he and Robert McCormick were operating both newspapers, the Daily News and the Chicago Tribune from their headquarters here in, Wash in um, Chicago. Eleanor Patterson was their oldest child. She was absolutely beautiful. I think you can see by these pictures and she was easily crowned Deb of the Year in 1924. Uh, she did a lot of frivolous things, including trying her hand at acting and was even cast as a nun in a small play here in the city before the first of her three marriages. It was her third marriage, though, that finally stuck. She married Donald Baker and moved to the East Coast. Today, she is best known for the Eleanor Patterson Baker Trust, which provides money to animal shelters around the country. Alicia and Josephine rounded out the Patterson family. They always seemed to take second stage to Eleanor, but really they were Joe's surrogate sons. They learned how to hunt wild game, to fish and fly airplanes. Both women were accomplished pilots. Alicia broke the women's flight speed record from New Jersey to New York in 1930. Josephine was the youngest commercial pilot either male or female, at the age of 17 to fly a mail route between Chicago and St. Louis. In the midst of their debutante season here in Chicago and much to their mother's horrors, the sisters flew the coop. They took off for India where they both bagged tigers and leopards. Like Sissy when she was young, they lived very aimless, privileged lives in search of something meaningful to do. Well, Joe Patterson didn't really encourage any of his daughters to become journalists. He even fired Alicia from his own newspaper when she got the facts wrong in a story. So Alicia decided to write for Vogue magazine. Josephine wrote for the Chicago Daily News here in the city. She was on the crime beat after all those gangsters but really preferred her father's farm or the Wyoming ranch. Everything changed when Alicia's third husband, Harry Guggenheim, purchased a defunct newspaper in Long Island, New York. Beginning in 1940 and for the next 20 years, Alicia was the executive editor and publisher of Long Island Newsday, an aggressive little paper that challenged the New York Dailies including her own father's, in circulation and prestige. Much like her beloved Aunt Sissy, Alicia had lived a life of fame and fortune, but finally found great purpose in journalism. 
1954, Newsday won the Pulitzer Prize, landing Alicia on the cover of Time magazine, just like her Aunt Ruth McCormick. She also was an early supporter of Adelaide Stevens in her newspaper that um, kind of went against script with the politics of the rest of the family. Alicia, though, lived the same hard drinking, hard living life as her Aunt Sissy and her own father. She died of colon cancer in 1963. Her ashes were strewn over her private hunting estate in Kingsland, Georgia. Josephine established the Alicia, excuse me, the Alicia Patterson Foundation in her sister's honor to grant special uh, financial uh, stipends to print journalists and photographers. Josephine Patterson was seven years younger than Alicia, but they were partners in crime nonetheless. Like her sister, Josephine had a checkered education, a flamboyant social life, and an early love for flying. Josephine had her father's love of the soil, however, and during the 1930s and 40s, she managed the Patterson family farm in Libertyville, which ultimately became Hawthorne Melody Dairy, and she inherited Sissy's Flat Creek Ranch, and so she managed that as well. Josephine married Ivan Albright, the very successful and famous Chicago artist, and the two of them moved to Vermont, where they lived for the rest of their lives. She wrote a weekly column called Life with Junior for her sister's newspaper called Newsday. And she went on to become an animal rights activist and benefactor of the arts. I think both Alicia and Josephine regretted bagging those tigers and leopards. Josephine also lived long enough to see her daughter-in-law, Madeline Albright, become the first female Secretary of State in 1977. Josephine died in 1996 and is buried in Vermont. There was one more woman in Joe Patterson's life. Joe's silent partner in Chicago and New York was Mary King, editor of the Sunday Tribune, and the very first woman in the country to hold such a position for a major metropolitan newspaper. She and Joe had a very long-standing private relationship resulting in the birth of his only son, Jimmy. Jimmy would grow up suspecting, but not knowing until much later that Joe was his father. Joe's three daughters didn't know of their half brother for years. By 1925, Joe and Mary were both living separately in New York City, yet working together running the New York Daily News. Mary was quietly raising Jimmy with the help of her two sisters. Alice finally, finally granted Joe a divorce in 1938. And Joe and Mary were quickly married in New York City with Robert McCormick serving as best man. One of Alice's demands during the divorce proceedings was that her three daughters would share equally along with Jimmy in the massive McCormick Patterson fortune. Today, the James Patterson Trust is the 10th largest of its kind in the United States with, um, at least as of about 10 years ago, an endowment of $200 million. I want to quickly include the women in the Cyrus McCormick side of the family because they're pretty amazing too. Cyrus McCormick was Robert McCormick's great uncle and he's widely credited for inventing the McCormick Reaper. Nellie Fowler McCormick took over the Reaper business after her husband's death and ran it until her own sons were old enough to take over. In 1902, it was Nettie McCormick who led negotiations to create International Harvester, and she instituted the eight-hour workday and other labor reforms, which would go on to become the norm during that traumatic progressive era. Anita McCormick Lane was their daughter. She was the daughter of Cyrus and Nettie, but unfortunately she was a widow by the time she was 26 years old. 
So she devoted her considerable fortune to her son and his education. She funded the Francis Parker School in Lincoln Park, a school that is still going on today. She endowed the University of Chicago School of Education, and she purchased textbooks for the Chicago Public Schools, among other things. Harriet Hammond McCormick was the wife of Cyrus McCormick Jr. The death of their young daughter propelled Harriet to help found the Infant Welfare Society in Chicago and establish the Elizabeth McCormick Memorial Fund, which provides health aid and services to underserved communities all over the United States. Catherine Dexter McCormick was the wife of Cyrus and Nettie's son, Stanley. Their marriage should have been a glittering success, but Stanley's mental illness prevented that from happening. Her college degree in biology and her husband's illness motivated Catherine to establish a research foundation at Harvard to help combat and understand the disease of mental illness. Her belief in women's rights and her role as a suffragette led her to fund almost all of the research necessary to develop the first birth control pill. Catherine Dexter McCormick was from Boston. We don't hear much about her here in Chicago, but she is quite well known in the Boston area and especially at Harvard. So in conclusion, we look at this lovely photograph of the four children and their granddaughter and their grandfather. Joseph Medill's two daughters, Kate and Nellie, were unable to have careers of their own. They lived through their children and both feared the other son would get ahead of their own. Neither one of them frankly thought Sissy would amount to anything except to be a socialite. Rivalry and dreams of inheriting their father's newspaper led each woman to name their firstborn sons after Joseph Medill. Their constant competition should have driven this family wide apart. But the cousins divide their mothers. They went against script and they actually got along very well. They saw themselves as an elite tribe of four, dedicated to each other and the families and the women to come. Despite scandal, multiple marriages, great loss and great wealth, the name Medill took precedent over everything. I think Joseph Medill would have been very, very impressed with the women who made up his family. Whether they were joined by blood or by marriage, they shared common bonds he respected and could admire. Each woman honored her family history, whether it was love of country, the arts, politics, newspaper publishing, whatever it was, they stood completely behind the passions they cared for. They shared a deep love of the land and of animals. Several of these women were pioneers in their chosen fields. Others worked quietly to further their passions and their philanthropic interests, uh, not necessarily demanding that their name be front and center and get the recognition they thought they should deserve. They especially understood their checkbooks, and they understood that they had a great responsibility to do something with their money and do something that would benefit everybody and not just a small elite core of people. All of them had a fiercely independent spirit. And I think what surprises me with about all of them is um, the power they showed when somebody tried to overshadow them, their self-determination, and accomplishments stand today. And I think if we could tap into grandfather Joseph Medill, despite not having any sons of his own, he would be extremely proud of these women and what they have given us and the country. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Lori. If so anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and enter them in the Q&A below or the chat. I will be checking both. We do I have number for five. Oh, do you see the questions? Um, I see the number. Yes, I do. 
Okay, well, I, I'll go ahead and read them to you. Uh, very specific questions we have so far. The first one, who was the Medal of Honor winner that one of the McCormick women divorced for a McCormick? Well, you see, that's where those confusing names come in. Robert McCormick's father-in-law, General Bernard Irwin, won the Congressional Medal of Honor back in the uh, cavalry days. He then went on to fight in the Civil War. He had one daughter, Amy, who married Robert McCormick. Okay. And um, about the, we have a couple questions about the pearls. Did McCormick's second wife regularly wear the pearls that the first wife left for her? Well, you know, that's a good question. We don't actually have any images of Marilyn wearing the pearls. And when uh, she had her portrait painted, she does not have the pearls on. Uh, it would have been a much shorter necklace than the great big long strand that Amy had. I know that Amy gave one necklace to Marilyn, one necklace to her own sister, and I don't know who the third went to, but I think that they were pretty small necklaces after they were cut apart. Well, that answers the second, the follow-up question, did any later generations of McCormick women acquire or wear one of the pearl strands? Um, my guess is that one of Marilyn's daughters from her first marriage received her strand of pearls. Okay. And what next question is, what is the name of the five-star resort of a McCormick woman in Cal Carrington in Jackson Hole, Wyoming? So that is Sissy Patterson's Ranch. It is still owned by the Patterson family, and it is simply called the Flat Creek Ranch Resort. And uh, it is exquisite. If you are a fly fisherman, if you like to ride horses, if you like to hunt game, uh, and the cabins are named after Sissy, after Cal, after Josephine, which I think is kind of neat. That is very cool. And it's very expensive, let me say. Oh. Let me that. <laughs> Our next question, uh, where is the Josephine and Adam Albright drawing or painting that you showed? Well, most of those are in private hands or in a museum in Vermont. Um, Alvin Albright is, Ivan Albright, excuse me, is most famous for painting the after picture in the portrait of Dorian Gray, the movie. Uh, he paints the really fantastical painting that Dorian Gray turns into. And many of his pieces are at the Art Institute, but not the painting he did of Josephine and some of the others. Okay, uh, our next question is about the, the family tree. Um, so if you email me at ce at wheatonlibrary.org, I'd be happy to email that out to you. Um, I did email everyone registered up to about 15 minutes prior to the program with that attachment, um, or you can um, put your email in the chat, you can set, uh, the chat to host only so only I see it and I'd be happy to email that out to you. And if I may just add to that, if you can print the family tree in color, it will help you because I've put each each individual family line in a different color just to help you with the flow. Yeah, definitely. Our next question, uh, why didn't Madeline McCormick Albright make the photo at the end? <laughs> I suppose I had to pick and choose. They all didn't make the photo, the photo montage at the end. But, you know, I find it interesting that Madeline and her husband, who was also named Joseph, um, chose names from the McCormick and Patterson family to name their daughters. And... Um, so they too were continuing that line. And we had a couple comments, just great research, uh, great presentation. Um, as you delved into these lesser known stories, do you have a favorite or can you narrow it down to a favorite amazing woman in each generation? Well, that's tough because I kind of go back and forth. I'm really impressed with um, the, the early 
club woman movement in Chicago starting at about the time of the Civil War and going into about the 1930s. And Kitty was at the forefront of that. Uh, she was, as I said, a founding member of the Fortnightly Club, which is considered the first official women's club in the city of Chicago. And as I said, it's still going strong today. So I'm impressed with her personal resolve to do good despite her wealth. Um, I'm also pretty impressed with Ruth Hannah McCormick because of her work with suffrage and how she helped achieve not only suffrage here in Illinois, but ultimately the final suffrage vote in, 20, uh, in 1920. Okay, and I did get some email addresses, so I will email those of you um, who asked uh, for the family tree from tonight. Um, and someone asked if this presentation would be available for a second view. We are recording it. It will be available on our YouTube page. I can post that link again. Um, and our next question um, was, the what was the club that Kitty Medill helped start or was involved? That's the fortnightly. And the fortnightly uh, headquarters are up in um, the Gold Coast in a lovely building there. And like I said, it's still very active today. Very interesting. Our next question was Alice Higginbottom from Joliet or Cherry Hill. It's my understanding that she was exclusively from Chicago. Um, if anybody can correct me on that, I'm happy to, to take that correction, but I thought she was simply uh, from the upper crust of, of downtown Chicago. Okay. And um, our last question, it looks like, unless anyone has any others, throw them in. Um, has anyone captured all of these stories in a book? It would be a bestseller for sure. And I agree. <laughs> well, um, actually in your own library, Courtney, you probably have the book called The Magnificent Medills. That was written maybe four or five years ago. And um, it, if you asked anybody who ever worked at Cantini and was required to do all the research at Cantini, you would say that that book was really a cut and paste of everything from all these other books that had come before it. It's not particularly the best read in the world, but it certainly is the latest book about this family. There are quite a few books about Sissy. Uh, just last year or so, there was a book about Alicia Patterson, a brand new book about Alicia. And unfortunately, that title is escaping me right now. But um, there are books, you just have to go to the library or um, search online to try to find them. Absolutely. And our reference staff would be more than happy to aid you in, in your research on, on these fascinating women. Um, and I, we do had a, have a comment uh, that we have a person here who knows that she was from Cherry Hill. So, Cherry uh, Hill, yeah. New Jersey. What Cherry Hill? I'm I, guess, I mean, I'm guessing New Jersey. Yeah, that's, when you say Cherry Hill, that's what I think of. So yeah. Her family but, must have come from there to Chicago. That's good to know. Yeah. Oh, Cherry Hill, Illinois. Oh, one Cherry of our, Hill, Illinois. So, oh, who knew? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> Thank know. Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. We always learn something new. Okay. If there are no more questions, I just want to thank you so much, Lori. This has been fascinating. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed. Um, this will be available on YouTube. And uh, thank you so much.